Okay, we have our chief data scientist uh, with us and 18F, leader of 18F. You also coined the term data science. Uh, Co-coined, it, it, uh, at best. It, it, but, uh, you know, Jeff Hammerbacher and I were working on this stuff. People have used the term in the past, but it really stuck. The, the joke of this, the way we actually figured out is HR was kicking our ass uh, at Facebook and LinkedIn, and they were like, you guys got to have a title for everything. And so finally we just said, what's a title that's reasonable? Analyst sounds too Wall Street, like research science to academia. Statistician. It, statistician pisses yeah. off the mathematicians. Mathematician <laughs> pisses off stat. So we actually then on LinkedIn, we put all the job postings and just substituted the title out and saw which one attracted the most people and, and the right kind you, of talent. You use data. You use data to figure out. To and, figure and out what your title should what be. That's what we called ourselves. And all right. it's kind of stuck. How many, how many of you in the audience are data scientists by raise of hand? How many data scientists do we have in the audience? A, you you could change your LinkedIn profile and get a raise right now if you <laughs> change it. So yeah, there's a, I hear there's a lot, of, a lot of good money and interest in data science right now. Um, earlier this year, you left your career in Silicon Valley to go into public service. Why did you do that? You, you know, you never expect a call from the government uh, unless you think you're in trouble. And uh, when the call came, it was something that I, I didn't even know how to think about. Like you just don't even, you're like, wait, what are you even asking me? And what does that mean? And there's something exceptional when you're actually meeting people in the government and at the White House and you're sitting in the room literally where World War I and II were planned or where the Marshall Plan was, was starting to get implemented. And when we think we do hard things and you think about what it takes to actually implement the Marshall Plan, you sort of get this, wow, every single moment of every single day, you are creating history when you're there. You, you have singularly by definition of your presence in a room, you have the ability to change the world every day when you're at the White House. That and, sounds... And, and it's, it's kind of a weird thing, but uh, there is no other meeting. That is the meeting where it gets decided. Uh, and so when you realize that and you realize what the opportunity is for you and your kids and your kids' kids, what, what, is, what is the greatest impact that you could have? Uh, and that was uh, when I traded off walking away from a bunch of upside because of a deal versus being able to sleep at night super well knowing that I tried my best to do what's right for the kids and the kids' kids. It, it turned out to be a no-brainer. Okay. You also, when you, when you, when you joined, you wrote in a Medium post that you would work to ensure data science policy protects privacy and considers societal, ethical, and moral consequences. Uh, there's been a lot of talk around privacy and data. What can you say to the American public to ensure that the government is not abusing the data and is also ensuring their privacy? Mm -hmm. When we structured this role, one of the, the very first things that we did is create a mission statement. Mm -hmm. uh, just like every company has a mission statement, Every department, every agency has a mission statement. And our mission statement is to responsibly unleash the power of data to make America better. It, that's, that's, it's super simple. But the key word is responsibly. Mm. And I think Secretary of Defense Ash Carter says it best, is that as a country, we are amazing when we engage directly in the hard dialogue. Because these problems aren't easy. Department of Defense, the biggest user of encryption, mm -hmm. also has the responsibility and is tasked with making sure all of us can sleep safe at night. How do you handle that? How do you work with that? How do you? That, and that dialogue, dialogue is the only thing. The Secretary of Defense, he's the first Secretary of Defense, Secretary Ash Carter is the first Secretary of Defense to come out to Silicon Valley in 20 years. That's crazy, given that Silicon Valley and innovation has been spurred not only by defense, but by federal spending from National Institutes of Health, all the way Department of Energy, all these things. So we have to, we have to engage directly in the hard dialogue to figure out the answers. Us coming into government is part of it. People espousing what is important is another critical element of it. 
but if we don't engage in the dialogue and we kind of just go off in our East Coast, West Coast worlds and kind of hide away from each other, we're going to totally screw this thing up. Well, and Fader, you, you came in to work in public service right. from Silicon Valley as well. From New York, the other Silicon Valley. From the other yeah. Silicon Valley. Okay, you were involved in the startup yes. world. Yes. Uh, went into public service to recruit yes. uh, people from tech into government. Absolutely. Okay, can you tell me, can you set the stage for everyone on, on what it, exactly it is you do? Absolutely. I came into public service, into the federal government after being, after leading and, and starting and leading two internet startups um, right before, because it matters, right? And I think that one of the things we're trying to do and build in the government is a cadre of amazing people, mission-driven engineers, designers, d data scientists, design thinkers, who can come into the government and help transform the way it builds and buys digital services, ultimately to improve the experience of the American public. The sell is here, uh, come work for the government to make things better. Yes. You're, you're going to be inspired. It's, it's a tough ask when, I mean, I, so I'm the host of yeah. Cribs, right? And I go into these yeah. amazing startups with meditation rooms and a yeah. personal chef and yoga and the rooftop deck yes. and they've got a beer garden. And I yes. mean, you're, you're asking them to give up their hoodies and jeans yes. and all of that and go into public service. Absolutely. And it's because I believe, just as I was, very impact driven, I believe there's a healthy, solid percentage of entrepreneurs out there who are impact driven. And for those entrepreneurs, there's no better place to have an, a greater impact than our nation's government, period. What are you looking for right now? I mean, what are you hoping is the next thing that needs to be impacted that you're looking to hire for? So we, so I run a digital service team called 18F. We're 150 people strong, and we are a team of engineers, designers, uh, usability experts, and data scientists that SWAT team out into federal agencies to help them think through and build out their digital services. So we're looking for all of the above um, to come in and, and help. In addition, we're also looking for incredible technology companies to come in and help and, and help in their way as well. We're having a hard enough time uh, hiring developers here. Right. How, I, what's the scene in the government? Is it, is it just as tough? What's, what, what are you offering? It's just as tough, um, but the, the, mission, the mission really speaks to people. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what we have, right? America is what you make of it. So we need people to roll up their sleeves and make something of it. Um, we need more, more talented people coming into the government, whether even if it's for a tour of service for a year or two, to come in and work with government folks who are very willing to make a difference to the, to the way that we interact with the public and, and, and join us. If we did not have the healthcare.gov fiasco, yep. do you think we'd even be having this conversation? I think it was an important catalyst for change. Um, we had already established something called the Presidential Innovation Fellowship Program prior to the healthcare.gov fiasco that brought in really senior innovators as entrepreneurs and residents um, into the government to kind of put certain types of talent at the ta decision-making table. That had already started, so the movement had already begun, but I think the healthcare.gov fiasco just pushed it over the edge and, and supercharged it. Yeah, it was, it was a three-year project, to yep. almost nearly a billion dollars. Yep something that could have been yes. built in less than a year for a million dollars, mm -hmm. not, not, not as much, and then it was launched, and then it was still not working. So that's kind of where you come in. Absolutely, when the government saw that yeah. healthcare.gov could basically be reborn in, this, in a series of a couple of months with a handful of people, they realized that, they're, that they've been doing something wrong, right? And that they didn't, they lacked the talent at the decision-making table to, be, to make this a reality. Uh, people that worked in the open, people that worked agile, that were data-driven and put users first. And this is, these are the types of people we're bringing in to solve these problems. What, going back to you, uh, DJ, what sort of information is being collected? I think people are maybe a little bit confused about what sort of data you're looking at and gathering and offering to people. Sure. So let me talk just a high line of two, two of our major data initiatives. Actually, first, like, underlying all of this is our effort to make data open and available to everybody. So right now, if you go to data.gov, you'll find more than 130,000 data sets available that you can download and use. That was one of the data sets that I used when I was a grad student to figure out uh, something called the Maryland Ensemble Element Filter, and now is used in every major weather forecasting system. Mm -hmm. We had another literally a 10th grader using open data from that system on genetic information to figure out cancer prediction techniques. The people who run data.gov 
Right, it's Fedra's mm -hmm. team. Uh, and this is why our work dovetails so closely. Another one of them that is going to be a big one here, and you're gonna, you've are you seen much more. For those of you that are especially involved in healthcare startups, you want to see what uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare mm -hmm. and Medicaid Services, has released. That data tells you is a, is a playbook of how you should be thinking about the markets and how to navigate to build a company. Well, another one is uh, pr uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, which the president announced at the, the, st this year's State mm -hmm. of the Union. And what it does is it brings together disparate data sets from uh, at the genetic genomic level, as well as environmental where, where data. Where are they getting everything. that information though? People in that case, you actually volunteer as a participant to be able to be in that. And one of the things that is central to these tenants that we do is the president first has a mandate that says all data that the government produces by default is open and machine readable mm -hmm. and not PDF machine readable, yeah. like, you know, by a computer machine readable. The other part of this is that the data is mm -hmm. your data. You should have access to that data. And in particular, in the case of this health data, it's a, one of the things that you'll find is go try to get your own healthcare data and see how hard it is. But these systems are supposed to help you bring together the data if you would like to contribute it to science to help improve and figure out what the next generation of research is. But uh, uh, it's done with a very close oversight by the participants. The participants are front and center in the governance structure of those efforts. Okay, so let's, uh, there's, there is some confusion in, in, you know, some people fear that the government is tracking every text, every tweet, every dial. How do you ensure that this voluntary information is not going to also be used sent to the NSA or used against citizens? What are you doing to protect right. that? So first, there are congressional and legal oversights already in place. For example, with your genetic and genomic information, it cannot be used against you for discriminatory practices. That's, that's been around for quite some time already. Uh, the second is, the, which, which you're talking about, is a number of questions around liability. And, and that it gets in the case of a lot of the pharmaceutical manufacturers, et cetera, especially if you're doing something which is called off-market drugs. Like we have this incredible stockpile of drugs that are out there. They may work for you, but you can't access them because somebody says, whoa, 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 well, you might find out that it works for you, but then somebody else who's similar but slightly different, mm. it may have some adverse impact. And so there's challenges there with that case. In the case of the national security component of this, the, 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 the key thing here is that, that infor this information is predominantly for use for science and research. It is not- But it could be taken to, I mean, it could be used for something else. Is, is there a protection in place? You know, the thing I, find, I found most with data in the case of, of these things is we like to, th we, we, we almost get into the science fictionized ver version. It's like, look at all these cameras at the Louvre and it's like, who's looking at the cameras? It, it, there's so much information overload that actually what you want to be doing is looking at less data rather than more data. Isn't that part of the problem though? There's, there's so many volumes of data that people are concerned. There's too much data. How much information is just too much? That's, that's right. So one of the big things that you will be hearing, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this out loud now, is you'll be hearing much more from us is about data and data discrimination. Mm -hmm. Data has an incredible opportunity to both eliminate discrimination or predatory practices, but it also affords an incredible opportunity for people to use data badly for evil. We just saw this in this case with the EPA right now of how people are using you know, the microprocessors and the data to turn off the admissions during testing. We have to have a very firm conversation of what is ethics, what is ethical behavior, not just at the computer science level, but all the data science level as well. And part of that will be our, uh, a big major uh, uh, report on data and discrimination. Yeah, um, for both of you, because you've both come from the startup world, uh, you come from Silicon Valley, you the other Silicon Valley, uh, New York, yeah. Silicon Alley. Silicon Alley, yeah. Uh, what was the culture shock going from that world into the government where as we've talked about before, you're not using Heroku, you're not, I mean, there's a yeah. whole bunch of tools that you're missing. Yep. What was the cult culture shock like and how did you handle it? Thankfully, we've tried to create an ecosystem for 18F, the digital service consultancy inside the government that feels kind of like 
a digital service consultancy outside the government. So it's a safe place to experiment. We hack bureaucracy as much as possible so we can get people in the door quickly. Um, but you're right, you know, there are essential differences. There is still a lot of bureaucracy no matter how much you hack. There are tools and, and processes missing that the private sector has. It take a really long time to get through and approve. Absolutely. And then, the, and then that is an old tool. Absolutely. Right now it takes about a year to, do business, to get a contract with the government. That's way too long. Um, so one of the things that bringing all these people in from the private sector has done is it's highlighted the, the differences between the private sector and the public sector. So bringing in 150 engineers and designers, you start hearing things like, why don't we have Slack and why don't we have Heroku? And that prompted us to look at the process by which a company enters the government. And right now, we're the, for the next year, our big mission is to hack that process and make it shorter and faster. What impact have you, do you think you've actually made so far? Yeah. Uh, well, the first is we'll invite you to our crypt, <laughs> <laughs> and you can White House crypts. Our White, White House, House crypts are pretty cool. Uh, we've got a pretty cool house, uh, I, I, and a lot has happened over our, our country's history there. The the um, what is the impact? I think happens on multiple dimensions, and this yeah. is where it's interesting where the worlds we live in. I operate much more in the policy realm, where what we're trying to do is figure out is this the direction we want to go or is this the direction we want to go? And those micro inches in policy have a massive impact and outcome over decades. And so we will be judged over a very long arc of, of what happens. Mm. There are also very concrete programs and that is where I can't do my job without the implementation capability of someone like Federer's team. Yeah. Because if I'm trying to get precision medicine out the door and start getting it built in a way that is not gonna cost us a ridiculous amount of money, is safe, secure, has all the privacy controls, somebody's thought through all the edge cases, that's, that's really what's, what's essential. Yeah, and that's, that's a wonderful use case. We were just on the way up on the stage, we were talking about this, right? So DJ is going to go in and he's working on precision medicine and the policy behind it. And we're going to put together a team that will support him and his efforts that can go and actually execute the digital services or the data, the, the data needed behind it to actually like make it a reality. One last question for you, yeah. for each of you. Yeah. Uh, what does the government need to make things better now? What do you need now? Uh, it's super simple. Yeah. It's, it's all of you. Yeah. Uh, let's call a spade a spade. You know, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it really mean to be an engaged citizen? And, and some of you may have heard, Sarah wrote about it, we, we lost one of our great citizens uh, earlier this week. One of the things you'll be seeing is uh, that we have like what's starting to be called the Jake Brewer Pledge. And we're asking ourselves, what does it mean to really jump in and help solve the problem? And this is our country. We determine its trajectory. We collectively determine its trajectory. If we're not doing it together, we're responsible for the fact that the direction it takes is something that we are not okay with. So the number one way to do this is we should live in a world where public service and your help is expected. We don't go to places and we say, hey, where did you go? So go, whoa, you went to school? We live in a world where we should have, you go, oh, where did you do your public service? What did you do to contribute and make the world better? And you should be chomping at the bit to figure out what is that avenue that change that you could have because of your skills could have on all Americans and as a result because of who we are as Americans on the entire world. Yeah, I, I can't echo that enough. We have this, we say at HNF, America is what you make of it. So roll up your sleeves and make something of it. And we say that again and again, and our, our call out is to people that want to enter the government. There is now a place where you can enter the government that's a safe place, that's designed for people like you, where you can be deployed and work on some of the most impactful priorities that this administration has to offer. Um, also for companies, we're now ready and we're, we're getting better at bringing in innovative companies. So do business with the government. It's important, just as important to do business with the government even though it requires a few more hurdles than it is to do business with the private sector. All right, thank you so much, both of you. Of course. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.